here's an idea. Maybe the only way to pay for ambitious space travel is if it doubles as entertainment. All that talk about Mars and the teletransportation paradox in our Three Short Ideas episode from a couple weeks ago got me thinking and reading more about Mars, Mr. Friendly Red Potential Home Away From Home. And in my internet space travels, I realized that I completely missed Mars One's announcement that they had decided on the finalists for their doomed, I mean, soon to be mission. No! If you missed the dish, here's the gist. Dutch money haver Bas Lansdorp announced two years ago that his not-for-profit Mars One would send a small group of people to that planet in order to establish a permanent human presence. Those people would be selected based upon an open application process. Meaning like, open, open. Anyone can apply. You wanna go to Mars? Come on down. On February 16th, 2015, Mars One announced the Mars 100, a hundred finalists that will be further whittled down into only a few groups of four. Right now, the plan is that one of those teams of four will be sent to Mars in 2024 to live for as long as they can live. No coming back, one way ticket. Now, if at this point you are shaking your head in absolute disbelief and or incredulity, you are in super good company. Everyone who is anyone in the space game has said that Mars One is doomed. Chris Hatfield, Wired, former astronauts, space professionals, astrophysicists, they all say it is utter foolishness. Here, watch. Hey, Gabe, Mars One, utter foolishness, right? Utter foolishness sounds about right. The trip alone might turn their bones to glass. See, Gabe knows what he's talking about. He has a PhD in physics, but more importantly, a YouTube show, which is great. You should watch it. He knows what he's talking about. Experts say that Mars One is going to cost 10 times as much, take 10 times longer, be a hundred times more dangerous, and require significantly more planning than is currently arranged. Basically, if we ever meet Evgenia on Mars, it's not gonna be as soon as 2024, and probably not because of Mars One. But snark aside, let's real talk, Mars One, is exciting. Mars has long, long been a symbol of hope, a second chance, another planet to ruin after we're done mucking up this. Oh, sorry, I forgot, snark aside, forgot already. People are talking about Mars One. So many people applied. For countless lay people, Mars One is the most visible and exciting attempt at the colonization of space. Why is it so visible? Because it's entertaining. I mean, yes, it is fascinating, and like I said before, it does provide that sense of hope. But I mean, come on, we all know that if something is fascinating and or inspiring, that doesn't automatically mean that people are gonna care about it. And entertainment actually is a part of Bas Lansdorp's plan. One of the original funding sources of Mars One, and arguably its biggest PR feature, is that it would double as a reality TV show. People training to go to Mars, people going to Mars, people being on Mars, probably kicking the Martian bucket, all on TV. And as much as I want to give Tina Fey, oh brother, faces to infinity and beyond, part of me thinks that maybe that's a great idea. I mean, it's a terrible idea, but it might work anyway. Who are the big players in space exploration? NASA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, SpaceX, each of them differing degrees of underfunded and in need of resources. If you're gonna bring home all of the bacon, it seems like the three best ways are one, entrepreneurship and investment, which is where Boss and Elon got their start. Two, real estate investment, and I think it's fair to say that it's not exactly a seller's market on Mars right now. And three, entertainment, doubly so if it involves superheroes. Diane. Remind me to call Boss and pitch Avengers on Mars, the first MCU entry to be shot in actual space. In talking with the New York Times a couple years ago, Lonsdor put it thusly. We are talking about creating a massive media spectacle, much bigger than the moon landings or the Olympics, with potential for revenue coming from TV rights and sponsorships. Except... Just a few months ago, the production company that Mars One was in talks with, Endemol, the people who are probably best known for making the UK reality TV series Big Brother, dropped the project because they couldn't, quote, come to an agreement on the details, which I think is code for... <laughs> nope. 
Lonsdorp says that that is not gonna stop him though, and that entertainment will still be a major component of the funding, a documentary style project produced by an as yet unnamed entity. Beyond making me wonder what they would have been making with Entomol if not a documentary style project, this also reinforces for me the connection that Lansdorp sees between the future of space exploration and entertainment. From the very beginning, he said he had no idea how to develop the gear, only that he was interested in figuring out the business model for space exploration. Did he find it? A massive contingent of sci-fi stories might say, yeah. Hunger Games, Battle Royale, Running Man, Stay Tuned, even The Truman Show to a certain degree, all draw some connection between the state of a society, profit, and the publicly broadcast trials and tribulations of specific people for entertainment. And those are just movies. There are plenty of other stories, novels, and games premised on showing actual people in the way of actual harm because it's actually very profitable. What they also tend to have in common is some dastardly force drunk on power or hell bent on control or subjugation operating on some maniacal idea of what does and does not count as order. Or at the very least, someone acting like the emperor at the gladiator games, a final say, a presider of some kind. I don't think that there's any of that at play with Mars One, but it's hard to argue with its danger factor, the pure spectacle of it. The trip is explicitly one way. The central tension here is not will they make it, it is in what way will they end up not having made it. Their total success is still a weird and grim one. Some MIT students ran the numbers, and assuming that they do make it to Mars, they say that the first crew member would die on day 68. And sure, the moon landing was absolutely a spectacle, but I would argue that it wasn't designed as one, and I think that makes a big difference. If we're thinking from step number one that this mission has to succeed both as a scientific endeavor and a profitable piece of entertainment, how do we navigate that relationship successfully? I don't know. My gut says, ugh. That seems tough. So in place of specific recommendations, let me just say this. For me, and for lots of us, I think, our ideal of space travel was established by Star Trek, of all places. And this idea that humanity is able to traverse great interstellar distances to find new life and locations and provide guidance because we have moved beyond some measure of self-interest. Insofar as space travel represents the possibility of a global community which has moved beyond boring old power structures, will Mars One be reliant on them. If so, maybe that makes it no different from any other not fictional space program. But still, the relationship with entertainment leaves me feeling a bit dizzy. What do you guys think? Is entertainment a good funding source for the future of ambitious space travel? And do you see that as causing any problems? Let us know in the comments. And if you were to subscribe, I would be over the moon, but not on my way to Mars because we all know how that's gonna turn out. Not well for anybody, apparently. Last week, we talked about The Sims, Judith Butler, and gender performance. Let's see what you had to say. We're gonna do comments a little bit differently this week. I'm not gonna respond to particular comments, only a couple things that sort of came up a lot, themes that developed. But before we do that, I just want to say thank you to everybody who was in the comment section for last week's video, trying to have a reasoned and respectful conversation. You know, like I, I go to meetings at Google and YouTube and they ask, you know, how, like how do we get every comment section on every video to be like yours? I have to tell them that I, I literally don't know. I like, it's not something that I can tell them because it's just, it has to do with how great uh, idea channel viewers are. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who was, who was trying to have as good a conversation in the comment section last week as they could. It, it means so much. The first of two really big points that I want to talk about um, is the one about my proclamation that boys who aren't interested in fire trucks or video games and so on are not seen as referencing another gender because there were a lot of people in the comments who had an, uh, the opposite experience that um, in not being interested in those things they were called all manner of names like sissy, girly, etc, etc. And this, this was a thing that we had a bit of a conversation about before shooting the episode. The people involved in that conversation all had really different experiences and my personal experience experience um, as someone who was called no shortage of terrible names growing up was that the people using those insults didn't see me necessarily as as referencing another gender in my actions but rather saw femininity as an insult to hurl at a young boy that it wasn't that I was being 
girly, but that girliness was an insult, which I realize is is maybe kind of like splitting hairs. But of course, that doesn't mean that other people have had exactly that experience, and so there was definitely room for more nuance when we made that point. So thank you to everybody who wrote a comment about that idea, letting us know your experiences. The second of two really big points that I want to talk about is this idea that Butler's theories don't leave a lot of room for biological difference when it comes to the gender spectrum, um, specifically this idea of brain sex. From what I understand, a lot of the science is still in development and not meant to replace the cultural idea of gender, but rather contribute to it. Uh, but it seems that there is a difference in the brains of people who experience gender dysphoria, uh, that it is either the cause of gender dysphoria, a result of gender dysphoria, uh, but either way there, there seems to be some measurable, verifiable difference in the brains of those people. This is good for two reasons. The first being that if someone feels as though they are different but are ultimately unsure, this provides some sort of um, proof or validation. And the second being that it kind of erases the idea that gender dysphoria is a choice and that if there are people saying, oh, you're just choosing to be this way, um, there, there is a kind of verifiable proof that, that it is not a choice, it is part of who they are. However, there seem to be also competing ideas that the medicalization of gender could come with its own set of very, very complicated baggage. Like, let's say someone feels gender dysphoric and is actually ready to transition, but they need monetary support in the form of insurance to accomplish that transition. Um, but they don't have the necessary neurological markers to prove that they are in fact really gender dysphoric. Will their insurance now not cover their transition or not to the degree that they would before? It, this is, it's all really, really complicated and there are, there are many, many sides to each of these aspects and there are things that we had no idea about, due in no small part to the fact that we don't have this embodied experience. So I just wanna restate and re-re-restate. Thank you so much to everybody who let us know about these things, who um, hung out in the comments of last week's video and tried to have respectful, reasoned conversations um, and, and sort of let us know about their experience. It means so, so much. So yeah, thanks, and we'll we'll see you next week.